Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. It's been said that truth is the first <laughs> casualty of war, but the first casualties in the war that came to Lower Manhattan on September 11th were thousands of New Yorkers who died when terrorists transformed the World Trade Center's Twin Towers into horrifying and deadly piles of rubble. The rules are different in wartime, and they have changed dramatically since we suffered the first foreign attack on our soil since the War of 1812. Airport security has been tightened. A new anti-terrorism bill has targeted immigration and exposed basic means of communication to wider government surveillance. Anthrax-laced letters have killed postal workers and sent shockwaves through media companies and the United States Senate. We face the prospect of a national identity card for the first time in our history. Some of us, those of us of Middle Eastern descent, face heightened racial profiling, and some use free speech itself as a weapon to silence critics of government policy. What price vigilance? How much should our traditional civil liberties be abridged because of the war? Or is any compromise on our freedoms a victory for terrorists who have already shown a deadly disdain for America's secular pluralism? We are joined by a distinguished panel of New Yorkers <clears throat> to talk about our new realities. William Erlbaum is an acting Supreme Court Justice and adjunct professor of political science at York College. He wrestles daily with balancing the rights of individuals and the need for public order. Betsy Gottbaum recently won the Democratic primary and is poised to become the city's new public advocate come January 1st. Michael Myers is the executive director of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. And Raymond Kelly is senior managing director at Bear Stearns. He is also a former New York City police commissioner and commissioner of the United States Customs Service, who has been on the front lines of protecting our city and our, and our, and our uh, nation's borders. Mr. Kelly, let me begin with you, if I could. Uh, how, how, how should the rules change in wartime, and how have they sh changed? Well, I guess the best answer is it, it uh, depends. It uh, depends on the nature of the threat. We fought other wars in your setup. You said that we haven't had an attack on our, our shores since the war of... <coughs> of 1812. So it depends on the nature of, uh, of the threat. Obviously some significant things have, have happened since September 11th as far as the, the legislation that uh, you're talking about. The anti-terrorism. Uh, the anti-terrorism the anti right? anti legislation certainly is a lot more scrutiny at airports. Uh, this is an ongoing process. It's hard to say right now what liberties we're going to lose, how much privacy we're, we're going to lose. But, but clearly we're moving in that direction. And, and the question is, is this, is this common sense? Is this something we should be doing? Uh, I don't think we can put our heads in, in the sand. And one of the issues, of course, is stopping people at airports coming into the country. Uh, we had almost 6,000 Americans killed by 19 uh, people from, from the Middle East. I mean, that, that is a fact of, of life that, that we have to deal with. And I think in terms of screening as far as who comes into the, this country, that's probably a factor, that is a factor, that should be uh, considered. Ms. Gottbaum, let me turn to you. Your job as a public advocate is going to be to keep an eye on the new, on the new governmental administration. Uh, do, you place a higher, do you place a higher priority on, on monitoring cutbacks in civil liberties or in holes in the security blanket? Well, right now I think I put a higher priority on holes in the security blanket because I think people, and I represent a, a huge constituency, are really afraid. And I think our job or my job as public advocate is to try to allay their fears somewhat. So while I think we should be vigilant for on civil liberties, I will depend on people like Michael and Norman Siegel to help us on that area. And, and, and I will look to m being much more vigilant about making sure people are less afraid. Mr. Myers, should we fear a national identity card? Well, I think Americans are too fearful, period. And in this atmosphere and climate of fear when we should be courageous, when we should be the exact opposite to what the terrorists on September 11th were trying to wreak on our society. We should be courageous. We should demonstrate that this is a free society, that we believe in civil rights and civil liberties. We don't believe in racial profiling or ethnic profiling. You know, we Americans can't even distinguish between Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. So how in the heck are we going to start defining ethnicity in ways um, that we're going to start suspecting people based on their skin color or based on their face are based on some sort of profile as an government file someplace that they are to be stopped or searched and frisked and, and, and be made suspicious only because they come from a certain uh, national background or identity. The question of a national identity card, that's an oxymoron. When you talk about quote unquote foreign terrorism and keeping people from, out, from, from this country, national identity card 
is, <coughs> is taking away the civil liberties and the privacy interests of American citizens. A national identity card means that every American citizen is going to have to produce a card saying, hey, I'm Michael Myers, New York Civil Rights Coalition, or I'm Michael Myers, I live in New York, and my face is going to be there, maybe my, my thumbprint is going to be there, uh, the government's going to keep a lot of information on me on the, on the guy, in the guise of making us safer for Michael Myers. And guess what? Our national identity card wouldn't have saved us from Timothy McVeigh. It, our national identity card is not going to save us from uh, homegrown terrorists. And our national identity card doesn't save Israelites from terrorism. So this is a forced sense of security that we are fostering, bringing in these so-called new laws and new powers on, on government to vitiate the the fundamental culture and fabric of freedom in our nation. And we've got to be very vigilant about protecting our civil rights and civil liberties, but especially during wartime when we need free speech, when we need liberty. Justice Obam, how uh, flexible is the law, especially in a time of war? Well, uh, the law is always subject to, to some reasonable interpretation, but the role of the judge, and I have to speak tonight purely as a private individual, I'm not on the bench now, but the role of the judge, I think, has been stated most beautifully by the late Justice Jackson. He prosecuted the, the war criminals in Nuremberg, and while he sat and wrote in dissent in the famous case of Fred Korematsu, upholding, uh, 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 dissenting from a decision that permitted the internment of the Japanese, uh, he said that the judges only have the law and only have the Constitution. And if they give that up, then they become an extension of military power. Amen to that. Mr. They, Kelly. They intern the Japanese, not the Germans. Mr. <coughs> Kelly, you were a front line in the, on the Customs Service and the board of front lines in the, in, the, in the New York City Police Department. How do you use these tools that, as, a, as, an, as an enforcement tool, the tools that are, that are in the new anti-terrorism bill for, for uh, easier access to government, government surveillance of pay phones when people move <coughs> around to various pay phones, you don't have to get a, you know, get a, get a tap, you know, get a warrant for each, for each phone. How do you use these tools? How, how might that change people's lives? Well, I think uh, the eavesdropping uh, laws are written uh, many decades ago. And that, as far as that provision, we're simply catching up with the 21st century. I mean, people, you, we know, drug dealers experience, for instance, that they'll, they'll use 50 cell phones, use one, throw it away, and, and, and buy another one. So, as far as the same thing, that, supposedly the Bin Laden group has been doing uh, in Afghanistan. Right, right? exactly. That, that, that potential is there. So now you're able to follow an individual. You have an eavesdropping warrant, so you can follow that, that individual rather than a, than a specific phone. I think uh, there are provisions there for uh, better exchange of information from uh, federal, among federal agencies and from federal agencies to, to local agencies. I think that's something that's been long overdue, I can tell you in my uh, experience. It's simply, it, there's a lot of stove piping in Washington, some of it justified because of uh, rules and regulations, others because of, of, of turf issues. Now that, uh, that's, uh, that's changed. I think there are more controversial issues, obviously the ability to keep um, some uh, undocumented uh, uh, people in custody for, for seven days. Um, Look, times change. I think we have to be uh, we have to be flexible, as as Betsy said. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, concern out there, and I, I you know, it, it's easy to say, "Hey, let's go forward with our with our lives." I'm going to show them how how tough we are. I just read the book uh, Germs, and uh, let me tell you, there's some really scary scenarios in there uh, that that really make you sit up and and take notice. So I think we have to. Be more vigilant. We have to put some of these things uh, in place. Again, there are sunset provisions for for some of the provisions of four. Uh, it's, a, of it's, a four it's a four. It's a four-year sunset, though. Yeah, and I, I think uh, my view is that they're, they're prudent measures that, uh, what, in, in, in what some the, sense, were long overdue. But the people who passed that law don't even know what's in the law. Uh, I don't know if it's thirty thousand words or thirty thousand pages, but it's cross references, references to laws that are already on the books. Uh, how many laws do you need? How many words do you need? How many, how many times must you make American citizens targets of, of, of government surveillance? And we, when we're talking, talking about uh, quote unquote foreign terrorism, that, that law that, that is, is really focused on American citizens. It, it, it brings the rights of the privacy rights of students into significant question. Uh, it, it, it tracks our emails, it goes, on, it, 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 it goes into privacy areas 
that are unbelievable. They even make the, the uh, what's that called, the World Trade Organization protesters. Um, and I don't look, as you know, any kind of violence. But it makes people like the World Trade Organization protesters, quote unquote, domestic terrorists. In some ways, the, the, the law is void for vagueness. Um, but, you know, these Congress people who didn't even have any hearings on the bill, because, you know, to debate in American society today is unpatriotic. So we're not going to debate a law. We're not going to debate a bill in Congress anymore. We're just going to title it USA Patriot Bill. And anybody who wants to debate it is unpatriotic. This is, un this is un-American. It's un-American. It's unacceptable. Judge, um, these kinds of decisions about about um, wiretaps and authorizations for wiretaps come come uh, come before judges. Do would judges feel the political pressure? I mean, and do, and do judges react to that political pressure? Um, looking at it empirically, and all exceptions admitted, the country has a very strong tradition of popular justice. The courts are very empirically there. Are, there are exceptions, but have over time been very responsive to uh, uh, popular justice, popular ideas. In fact, in many decisions um, uh, on the constitutional level, the Supreme Court has cited public opinion surveys. Uh, but, and but, uh, judges but, who serve short terms, mm -hmm. you see this in the capital punishment context, and, and regularly are concerned with the reaction of the voters uh, to decisions they make in capital cases. But one of the unique things about America is the, is the role of the individual versus the majority. You know, it's really not majority rules, that, that, that the individual has a sphere of protection, that that, that, that popular, you know, that uh, popular justice, if you will, street justice, I mean, at some point, the popular opinion can, can, can move into a, you know, can move into a vigilante direction. So I'm saying, how does, I mean, do, do judges feel that kind of pressure? Um, I believe that it would be unreal to say that they do not. Mm -hmm. I, I think, however, that the job requires courage. It re an oath requires courage. One's duty requires courage. Uh, but uh, the aspiration and the, the deed may not always coincide. But the standards for judicial review, you, got, you can't miss this. The standards for judicial review in, in, ver in various aspects of the anti-terrorism law are very low. So judges, once something has been certified by a law enforcement official, um, the law says, the new anti-terrorism law says, the judge must issue the warrant, you see. So it's not, it's not, it's not the usual rules. We have changed the rules. And, you know, you also had Attorney General Ashcroft recently, just recently, uh, tell, after the passage of this law, with all these new laws and new te technology and new powers, he tells Americans across the nation, beware of an imminent attack in the United States. But with all this new wiretapping authority and all this invasiveness of our privacy, he can't tell us any more than that. He doesn't know where it's going to come Should from. Should he? Hey, the law was just this passed last week. You know, this was come a, on. Well, right? <laughs> and he, sent, and he sent to all the U.S. Attorney General, General say, U.S. attorneys in the United States, effective immediately. So, yeah, it was passed Give last week. week. But they are, they're effective immediately, and they supposedly have all these new powers, all these new techniques. Yeah, but Michael, but in this, but in this particular situation that you're talking about, what the Attorney General did, put out this notice, if, the, if, the, if they have information, Without a specific location, without a specific date, do you think it's better for the government to with, to to, to are, withhold that information, then, well, or to say well, this is what we know? We'll tell you what we know, yeah. even though we don't know much. Bob, if you're talking about government withholding information, that's a, that can take another hour. No, but program. this is an example because of government, the government not withholding. Particularly, if the judges would, will tell you, the government, particularly during quote unquote wartime, withholds information because number one, they don't trust the public to, to with the information. They want to have it, have it in confidential and classified. They don't want us. They, they say they, it's for military security. They don't want us to, 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 um, to telegraph troop movements and like that. But another reason why they don't give public information, including the media, the mass media, and that is they don't want public dissent. They don't want public scrutiny of their actions. They want to use media and use information for propaganda purposes. This is the history of this nation in terms of times of war, whether it's Vietnam War, World War I, World War II, Korean War, um, the Persian Gulf War. This is when liberty is at stake. And that's when you have the court cases because people who decide that they want to dissent, they want to burn the American flag, they want to oppose the, oppose the American government policy, they want to publish the Pentagon Papers, which shouldn't have been classified in the first instance, um, and, they go, and, they go, and they get prison, in prison, and we have to challenge the, the law difference. and go to court. And we need, we need not just courageous judges, we need judge? decent laws. <laughs> the difference this time, I want to go to you, Ray, is uh, that this were well, whether it started or not, this war came to our shores. Uh, 
And, Absolutely. I mean, so Absolutely. how does that, you know, you as a, as a, you know, you as a, as a law enforcement officer, how does that change the way you no. approach me, the kinds me, of things? Me, he's me as a citizen of uh, of this country, uh, clearly, it's it's home. It's in everybody's face. We've all been drafted in, into this war, whether we like it or not. So, I mean, it's it's always kind of a balancing test that you that you have to uh, apply in these things. Uh, you know. Yeah, we had a we had a, a war in Vietnam. <laughs> we didn't give up anything. We didn't give up any any liberties. It was five thousand miles off our shore. Now it's here. It's literally in our right here as we sit on this island. Uh, so it, the law has to be flexible, and and, and you have to balance uh, uh, these issues. I mean, clearly, as I said, the, the threats that are out there are very very frightening, and uh, it, it it takes uh, it, again it it demands. A flexibility in our response to the, to the situation. Well, yeah, just uh, it, it, it suppose, uh, without in any way taking on a good deal of your statement, I just want to respond to one small part of it. As I read the history, uh, there were uh, uh, reactions to Vietnam. I seem to recall an event called Kent State, where <laughs> some students were killed, and, and I remember a, a, some thwarting of demonstrations, and it, it did have an impact on free speech. That, of course, leaves the question aside as to the justification. I'm not, uh, that's a complex issue. Yeah. But historically, even Vietnam involved a good deal of repression. Except I, I think the issue, I'm, I'm sorry, well, but no, the, the, the issue really has to do with broad-based uh, uh, surrendering, if you will, of, of some of our liberties. Yes, uh, granted, I was in Vietnam. Uh, plus, I pleased the demonstrations after I came back from Vietnam. So I'm very sure. uh, very uh, aware of that. But, I, but it, was, it was certainly on a much smaller scale, much fewer people were uh, affected than potentially what we're talking about. I think here. it's also the case in Vietnam is that you had a, a, a sizable anti-war movement, you know, uh, where you had, a, a, you know, kind of a critical mass of people opposing the war that you certainly don't have at this point with well, this, this war. Well, this has just started. And the wasn't, just started. You didn't have that sizable mass at the beginning of the Vietnam War. Well, except that you didn't have... Um, a vast amount of support at the start of the Vietnam War because the Vietnam War wasn't even thought about. You have a different kind of psychological, you know, there's a psychological assault as well as the physical assault in the city. Don't and get, I think the level of unity... Bob, I don't, want you, to get, I don't want you to get me wrong. I am, you know, going back to that U.S. citizen stuff. I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm an American. I'm a patriotic American. I believe in the American flag and all that stuff, at least what the American flag stands for. And the American flag, to me, stands for the United States Constitution. It stands for liberty. And I will salute liberty, and I will salute the American Constitution. But at the same time, I lost three friends in the World Trade Center, so nobody is uh, good friends. Uh, nobody is going to challenge my patriotism and challenge my identification with the victims. All I'm saying is that in terms of the culture and fabric of American society, what we value as a society, our individuality, our privacy, we don't like government surveillance when it's not necessary. All I'm saying is when you take these actions in the names of my three friends, I say not in my three, three friends' names. You know, another part of this besides the, um, besides the attack on the World Trade Center, of course, is the anthrax attacks. And the and the letters that have been coming through the mails affecting postal workers in Washington and New York, media companies here in New York City, the United States Senate, the Supreme Court, the mailroom that feeds the White House, the mailroom that feeds the State Department. Um, some of this is now airborne. There's a, there's a sense of foreboding. And um, Ms. Gottbaum, you were, prior to, prior to running for public advocate, you were the head of the New York Historical Society. Do I have that correct? You do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, talk a little bit about what happened. In, was it 1866? 1866. There was a, an epidemic of cholera in, in New York. That it, was, it followed another epidemic, I think, in the 1840s. And in, in 1866, the um, Department of Health and the police went into people's homes and took out bodies, whether you liked it or not, if it was your home, took out clothes, burned them, got rid of them, and in effect stopped the epidemic. <coughs> and it was a clear, um, it, it, was, it was clearly for the public good. And it worked. And um, I mean, I believe in that particular time that it was the right thing to do. And um, I, think, um, I think you have to look at historical precedents. By the same token, we went, as you mentioned earlier, I think, Michael, much too far with the internment of the Japanese in the Second World War. So you have to be vig vigilant at the same time that you really do have to think about the public good. And I was going to say to Michael, Michael, where does the public good come in in, in in, in where we are right now and, and stopping or I trying just, to stop. Well, look, I, again, I think we have enough laws. I think we have enough authority in, in government uh, to handle most criminal actions. And, you know, this is quote unquote a war, but it's also a criminal action. Um, but with all the new powers, with all the new technology, 
we're not we're, we're still bombing <laughs> Afghanistan and uh, we're still trying to find um, bin, bin Laden um, and I would say if this technology works that they're turning on American citizens why can't all those satellites and all that technology find bin Laden and why can't you get people out in Afghanistan find a terrorist and they're also terrorists by the way uh, including the heads of state that we know where they are and we don't get them um, so this is a this is a situation which I think is ripe for critical analysis, inquiry, and free speech. And that's why, and I'm, I don't want to insult my host, that's why I'm so concerned at City University of New York and City College when the students try to have a critical assessment of what we are about to go into in terms of public policy and a war in Afghanistan and try to raise questions about that. They were, re, they were um, pounced upon by the City University of New York trustees and the chancellor. And, and as if students don't have free speech rights. Of course students have free speech rights. They just got to exercise them. Ray, um, as, as the head of the Customs Service, you were one of the frontline agencies at the at port of entry airports, and, you know, along, uh, along with immigration. And a lot of the anti-terrorism bill is targeting immigrants coming in. Uh, you know, we've, we've also seen moves to tighten student visas for immigrants. Uh, Bob Kerry, who was here the last time, the president of New School University, points out that immigrant students bring 12 billion dollars into this into the national economy and by you know cutting back students you know student immigrant visas you're potentially cutting your nose to spite your face tell me about the nation's borders i mean the degree to which does, this goes after immigrants i mean do you have does it and i'm going to ask you this question as well judge does does an immigrant have less rights in this situation than an american citizen yes but, you know, they're, they're, right right it's a legal question. Too. You're, not, right. you're not a citizen coming in but i think our borders are very porous. Um, the, and, and part of the reason is uh, lack of resources um, on, for Immigration Naturalization Service, Customs Service. Trade, for instance, has doubled in the last eight years, more than doubled. And yet resources are, are the same um, in the Customs Service, the same in INS. 150 million more people in the year 2000 came into the United States than they did in, in, in 1990. There's almost a half a billion entries. Hmm. We, we don't know as much as we should about who's coming into the country. And if you go to most developed countries, that, that's not the case. There's, there's a lot more scrutiny uh, as far as who, who comes into their, their country than, than, than there is here. But I guess, you know, I guess part of the, one of the, I guess the crux question is that the price of finding out that information, does, does the price of finding out that information undercut what it means to be America? Well, I, I, I think that, that uh, again, it gets back to, mm -hmm. to balancing. This is a uh, unique time in our, in our history. We've been attacked right here, as I say, on, uh, on this island. There are some things that, that, that simply have to change. I would I'd say that's a pretty strong statement as far as undercutting you know, what we stand for as, as Americans. But I think we owe it to our citizens, uh, as, as Betsy said, to, to have more information about uh, who, who's coming in uh, at this time. We, we simply don't know who we don't know who's coming we don't know where they go when they when they come into our country it's a standard uh, uh, con game to come in and ask for asylum or or to tear up your documents and then over get, over and, get over stay of and, and there's been no enforcement agency that's been able to follow up on it certainly not INS they're, they're, they're fragmented and, and they're under resourced so I think it, it's time to to look uh, much more closely at, the, at these policies judge Immigration obviously is a federal matter. You are you are a, you are a state judge. But what's your sense of um, the, you know a question of particularly immigrants, particularly in CUNY, where you have a large number of immigrant of immigrant students, and in the private universities where you have a, in, in this city you have a lot of immigrants. Uh, if does an immigrant appearing before you, whether documented or undocumented, is there any difference in the rights that that that, that, that person has in the state system? In my courtroom, yes. I, I would be sh I would be terribly ashamed if uh, if that were so. But you're talking about a, an overview and a process. Um, that, except that that person would, I think, in a federal court, that person well, would have a different level of different level you're of. You're talking about what the law protects or right. the attitude of the judge. Well, both, I guess. Well, okay, let's let's break it up. Okay. As far as the uh, uh, attitude of the judge, again, uh, uh, presumptively, people do their job no matter what their work consists of. But, but uh, there is an empirical issue and a presumptive issue, a normative issue. Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, uh, xenophobia is a very old phenomenon. Uh, there's even an interpretation that uh, 
uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was because of the xenophobia in that society. It's an old phenomenon. And uh, at an empirical level, uh, people suffer from it. I, I think judges suffer from it less than others. Now, as far as the law is concerned, uh, one has better standing in general as a citizen than as a non-citizen. You come here under a green card, you come here undocumented, the, the law provides less legal protection. It's considered to be a, a matter of classification. Um, and it, the Equal Protection Clause doesn't require an absolute mechanical equality. It allows that classification between citizens and non-citizens for certain purposes. Now, Ms. Gottbaum, you're, um, you're going to be the public advocate in the government, which uh, in essence ignores federal laws now which tell us that we have to report illegal immigrants. I mean, we basically mm -hmm. have a, we, you know, there's basically a city order dating back to Ed Koch that we're not going to turn in immigrants, undocumented immigrants who report a crime or go to a, or or go go to a hospital or go, go to school, school, even though technically we're supposed to do that. Um, I mean, how do you, you know, how do you look at this, these questions of immigrants in a city? Well, you know, you're going to be the number two off, you're going you're to be first in line to be mayor in a city in which you have a higher percentage of immigrants than at any time in our history, even when my grandparents came in in 1910. I mean, you know, we're talking about higher percentages now. So um, how do you view the degree to which uh, non-citizens are under more suspicion. I mean, I don't know, uh, you know well, why, why all, dress I, it up. I mean, it's under more I suspicion. Mean, I mean, I see the role of the public advocate, as I sort of said for the last 18 months, that we are there to help people to, to make government work better for all New Yorkers, whether they be illegal uh, immigrants or legal immigrants or just people who've fallen through the cracks. So I plan to have uh, an office where we're going to try to help everybody we can. I mean, and that's a big order in a city of 8 million people. On the other hand, I would like to have an immigration section in the office that helps people because so many people are confused, don't know what, what they can do, what they can't do. They're terrified. Um, I would like to have an office where people aren't terrified to come. We're not an enforcer. But, but Public we're advocate. But we're moving away from that kind of discretion for, for, on the part of but local why, officials. why, Michael? Because I'm because, not, I'm no, not because, the enforcer. Because, that, right. But we're moving away from local discretion because of the new federal laws. When they're now saying you must, uh, in terms of uh, immigrants and particularly students, the institutions are going to, they must report now. They must keep track. They must divulge uh, uh, pri uh, otherwise private records of students. This is now a must. This is no more discretion. And, and, and as the judge says, the judge has to read the law and, and not interpret it, read it and, and enforce it. And, and, and if the law has changed, as it has, then our liberties of persons as well as citizens have been, have been decreased. And finally, well, not only that, talk about xenophobia, you've got citizens and American citizens on, on airplanes because they're fearful and xenophobic. They actually don't even want to, they, only, they only, not only want to get their own seat assigned, they want to pick the person who's going to be sitting in the seat next to them. Now, this is ridiculous. This is fear. This is prejudice. This is stereotype. This is insanity. This is irrationality. And we've, we ought to know better than this. Well, yet still, Pilots are saying we're going to ground the plane because we don't feel comfortable flying with somebody who looks Middle Eastern. Let me turn to some questions from uh, students. Is this a? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll, we'll uh, do that in a minute. Ray, um, uh, in your in a, uh, again in, in policing the city, how do you? Uh, to what degree are, are officers aware of the immigration laws? Do the officers use immigration laws as tools, in order to, uh, as one more tool in the arsenal? Generally speaking, no. Mm -hmm. uh, now, things may change, no, no question about that. But I would say, generally speaking, as you mentioned, you mentioned a, um, a uh, provision that was put forward by Mayor Koch in, in, right. in, in the 70s. Right. And, and that uh, pretty much took the obligation away from uh, uh, the, the police department to report uh, immigration. Well, that was, a, a, that was a rule that made the city workable. I mean, the city was yeah. not workable if, if, if immigrants were not going to... Uh, go to the hospital if they had a communicable disease, if, right. if, if immigrants were not going to report crimes. That made the city unworkable. And it's one of the, and I'm wondering if it's one of the areas in which, the, and since the law has now changed, specifically saying that New York City cannot do that anymore, uh, this, is, this wasn't changed recently, this was changed about uh, two or three years ago, that, you know, is it an example of how the law can, can really undercut just normal normal life, you know, a normal life on the street. We couldn't live in this city under, you know, if, if everybody, if, if the vast number of undocumented aliens in this, in this city didn't go to the hospital. I mean, we're dealing with the anthrax 
question right now. Think of the, you know, we, you know, how would we have controlled the tuberculosis epidemic that peaked and then went down in this city yeah. as people as people did get treatment if they wouldn't have come in. So. Yeah, there's, there's a lot more sensitivity now, obviously, mm -hmm. in law enforcement to people's uh, immigration status, and you're going to see it used more and more as a tool. No question about it. You're going to see the police department working uh, more closely with Immigration and Naturalization Service. Let me turn for questions, if I could. Yes, my name is Joseph McManus. I'm attending Herbert Lehman College in the Bronx. And my question is for uh, Michael Myers, if I could direct it toward you. You're talking about identity cards. And recently in the paper, there's been a lot of talk about either scanning irises or retinas for entrance onto airplanes. Uh, I don't agree with identity cards, but how would that play into that uh, scenario? Yeah, I really don't know. I just read a, a recent uh, a study on, uh, from Rhode Island that talked about the, the new technology and in terms of those kinds of things. Uh, facial, what is it called? Facial. Face it, or face it is one, one Yeah, yeah. Face, but facial imaging and all that other stuff and, and identity cards. And they say that the technology doesn't work. <laughs> so, you know, just like the metal detectors don't work. But, uh, but, so, it is, but it is a passive system. It's, it's, it's not... It's, but it's, not, it's, it's an imperfect system. And, the, and, and, and you're looking for a system, at least in terms of security, when you get on an airplane, you're looking for a perfect system. And, and, Mike, and, and as I understand that, that technology, if you, if you, if you don't, if, if you've got mobs and mobs of people in the airport, you know, you've got to have a database, you know. Um, they have to be looking for somebody. In other words, they've got to have a, 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 a number of faces, or what we used to call mugshots in the old days, yeah. um, of suspected terrorists or criminals. And you've got to be in the database. And the technology is supposed to be able to pick you, the terrorist, or the criminal, out of that big crowd in the airport. And it's supposed to be able to do that. One question, My understanding is it doesn't do that very well. One question, of course, is the degree to which a national identity card is almost a moot debate because our social security numbers, which are not supposed to be national ID cards, national ID numbers are for all effects and purposes national ID numbers because you have to fill them out. Yeah. You're always told not for identification but, purposes, but that's just... But I don't produce my important. social security card when I go into buildings. I don't doubt that about you. Not, that's why <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. That's, that's, yeah, right. that's right. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, my name is Igor Maruchenkov. Um, I'm a student of uh, political science in Brooklyn College, and my question is to the panel. Uh, NYC is the capital of the, of the world, and uh, uh, everybody obviously in the U.S. and in the world is looking at the actions that NYC administration is going to be taking. Every citizen today in NYC is concerned both about the security and about liberties. And at the moment, security seems to be overwhelming the question of liberties. Uh, it seems that the war uh, at home is going to be going on for a while. So how can we balance the question of personal liberties and security and how can in, in doing that how can we avoid uh, the, uh, the security question overwhelming the uh, liberties question becoming a trend in the city politics and uh, in the politics of the US you well, I, I, let me take a stab at this and then let the, the legal experts come in. I mean, I'm, my, I think you're right. I mean, I think that we who are in government are going to have to make a tremendous effort to balance, and it's a very tough thing to do because all I hear are that people are afraid. They're not only afraid of the terrorists, the sort of war at home, but they're terrified about anthrax. So how do we meet that, those fears in an intelligent way, being honest? I think the worst thing is to lie to people. And I think we saw an example of that in Washington when we were lied to. And I think we can't lie. We have to be truthful, but we have to not in invoke panic. On the other hand, I don't know how we are vigilant. My only hope, as I said earlier, is that we can rely on people like Michael and the, all people who are our watchdogs of civil liberties to make sure that, that we don't step over the bounds. It's going to be very, very tough. But right now, I see my job as trying to allay people's fears. I, I really believe that, and I believe that in the most honest way that I can, uh, what can we do about some of these problems? For example, I want to tell you, I have to get this out. I had a briefing yesterday, everybody should get a flu shot because it will help the public health system if you do get the flu and you go to the hospital thinking you might have anthrax, at least they have a measure. And it is extremely important that we all do that. Now to me, that's a responsible response to a fear. But I don't know how to balance the vigilance on the civil liberty side, so I'll turn that over to one of the legal experts here. Well, I must say that uh, information is very, very important. Information. I don't. I don't know. For example, when you're exposed to anthrax, or, 
uh, when you're supposed to take Cipro, how long you're supposed to take Cipro. Um, uh, uh, is Cipro the only methodology for counteracting it? Um, it sounds like in, in the inhaled form, Cipro doesn't work. Um, and, and, and there's other things other than anthrax. I mean, today is anthrax. Tomorrow is going to be something else. Um, and I think when you have those a biological terror, um, I don't know if there's any kind of technology we're going to have or medicine that ma for that matter that's going to respond or prevent an outbreak of, of that kind of of that kind of nature. But I th with respect to the, the question of freedom itself, I think it's not for Michael, it's not for Norman, it's not for the Civil Liberties Union only. It's for people who carry the culture of America in their hearts to be in the faces of the legislators in the Congress, for example, and make sure they don't pass an anti-terrorism bill or USA Patriot bill without any debate, without reading the bill, without understanding the provisions of the bill. You got to, you got to ensure that the Congress is exercises due diligence. Students must exercise their free speech rights and not be intimidated by the administration and by trustees who are concerned about funding the university. You've got to do this. This is your society. This is your time. Um, I cannot keep freedom. You must keep freedom alive. Good yeah. evening. My name is Mary Linda Villafana. I'm a student of Baruch. Um, I've, in, I've enjoyed what I've heard so far, but I've not heard anything about our improved security living and working in New York. This about, question, sorry, about living and working in New York. This question is really for Mr. Kelly. I never realized up until this incident that you could carry a weapon on an aircraft. It's not the custom of other countries. And I became worried also what improvements are being made with the people who are checking our bags. I mean, they themselves may be terrorists. I mean, how is this going to be improved? Well, you've asked a, a, an excellent question. I was on the, and I still am technically, I guess, on a, uh, they call a rapid response team to assess airport security and make recommendations to the Secretary of Transportation. First of all, you're not allowed to carry a weapon on, a, on an aircraft in, in the United States. Uh, and it happens infrequently. Uh, you, there's a story about an individual who got on a Southwest Airlines plane about a week ago and, and it was a licensed carry, but had a gun with him and turned it over to the, uh, the, the flight attendant. That gets back to how we check luggage, how, how we provide uh, security in general at airports. And that's provided by the airlines. Uh, that's a fundamental flaw in the system. The airlines fund the system. They're profit-making organizations. They have obligations to their, their stockholders. They try to keep the cost down to a minimum. So what you, what you have is a very low-paid uh, workforce, very poorly trained workforce. They tell us, the industry tells us, that they have 120% turnover a year. I know that in some sites they had 400% turnover. So the system itself, as far as doing the, the checking of who gets on an aircraft, uh, is flawed. There's lots of things that, that have to change. My own view is that the whole system should be federalized, uh, rather than this, this um, thing that they're fighting about in, in Congress now. In the House, we have some federal supervision of it. It's simply not, not going to work. There are, we talked about this in, in my group. We have a model where you can federalize tomorrow. You make provisional federal employees. You put standards in place. The people who are working there now try to meet those standards. They're, they're trained. Uh, some will make it, some won't. Uh, it is a law enforcement function. We don't privatize the custom service on the border. We don't privatize uh, uh, INS or the FBI. This is now a law enforcement function. It, in my judgment, has to be professionalized and has to be, to do that, uh, federalized. Yes, Stacey Ann Jefferson, Medgar Evers College. This question is posed to anyone on the panel who can, you know, help me out a little bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> last night I was focusing on C-SPAN and most of the conversation was about immigration task force. Now I am a legal alien and as a result of this, I have a lot of concerns. One, I too stayed up for nights after September 11th. I lost friends, people from my country, people from, you know, from other countries and so forth. Now, yes, changes have to be made, but we're talking about, as Mr. Kelly said, police officers may be paying more attention to green cards and so forth. 
Now, what do I do? I'm feeling alienated. What would you say to other students like myself, other families like myself who are taxpaying individuals and so forth? What could we do to show that we are part of the U.S.? Because everybody is saying about citizens and Americans and so forth. American culture to heart, but I carry a foreign passport. H how do we go about filtering ourselves into the system where that we don't feel as though we've been focused on? Well, in the in the ordinary course of everyday life, you generally speaking, there there is no uh, there is no distinction between the legal resident uh, and the U.S. citizen. For example, when a police officer uh, stops you on the street police officer has to have a reasonable suspicion that you are involved in a crime. People just don't stop you because of your race or your ethnicity. I hope that doesn't, that's not happening, uh, although there, are, there are, are, are claims that that is happening, but it's not legal and it's not constitutional to, to stop someone just because they fit as a racial profile. So in the ordinary course of American society and civic life, uh, there, there are no distinctions. But when you go to those, those border points, when you go to those, those security points, um, there's there going to be a danger of racial profiling, just what I said earlier, and ethnic profiling. And that's a real danger. It's a peril to, to civil liberties and, and individuality. But moreover, you know, Ray Kelly and I fly a lot. I, I don't fly anymore if I can, uh, and can avoid it. But when you get past that metal detector, if it works, when you get past that metal detector, everybody, as I know, who flies, goes, stops off at the restaurant. And guess what? In the restaurant, there are knives and things like that. And they, you don't go through another metal detector once you pass through the metal detector to get on the plane. There are so many different ways, the poorest ways, uh, poorest ways of getting in, get, uh, of avoiding and eluding, so unquote, the security system. And, 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 and the weapons these days can be put into bags and things like that, don't, are not metallic. And the, and the person at the airport says to you, did you pack your own bag? Uh, yes, I packed my own bag. I mean, if you didn't pack your own bag, you're gonna say, yes, I packed my own bag. So we're in a situation of security now where it's just not real, folks. You can believe the government if you want that it's safe to fly. You can believe them. I don't believe them. Um, but at the same time, I don't believe them when they tell me about these things about, well, we're balancing civil liberties, but Ashcroft says we're not, there's no risk to civil liberties. We're not violating or vitiating mm -hmm. civil liberties. Mm -hmm. But they are! You, you know. just don't believe in period. <laughs> no, one of the, That's right. I'm very sus suspicious and skeptical, right? <laughs> one, of the, one of the... Go ahead. Gonna, Can I just take a yes, second that question? Yes. I think the uh, uh, people who are uh, immigrants who don't have citizen status uh, are in a uniquely vulnerable position right now, and I think it would be unreal to deny that. A lot of the provisions of the new law are directed toward immigrants. Now, that's not to say that there might not be reasons right now, and in times of war, uh, there tends to be this kind of restriction. It has many historical precedents going back to before Abraham Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus. But uh, uh, I, it seems to me what the the bar has to be very vigilant and the uh, and the bench uh, about observing very closely what happens with immigrants. It's broad discretion. A lot depends on the goodwill of people. Uh, if New York uh, is if New York's immigrant population is threatened, it would be like shooting ourselves in the foot. I live in the most diverse county in the world, Queens County. Uh, the uh, Seven Line has been na named a national trail, like the Lewis and Clark Trail. And uh, uh, it's very important that there be, a, and, and that we insist on as much transparency um, as possible. Uh, and one thing that makes this essential is because law enforcement agencies, like all other people who feel politically vulnerable, tend to circle the wagons and tend to try to uh, avoid bad public relations. And when mistakes are made, uh, there's a tendency, an understandable one, to try to de uh, to try to diminish the public disclosure of those mistakes. There are a thousand people now in custody. It would be very helpful yes. as soon as possible to have a list of those people, where they're being held, which of them has lawyers. In secret. And, yeah. and, and giving carte blanche is a mistake. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. I agree with the I, judge. Go ahead. I just, excuse me, I'm not sure we answered uh, your question, uh, which is how we can help you feel more integrated into uh, what's going on in New York today. And, and I, I'd like to give you my phone number for, for, for afterwards so that you can maybe call me when I'm in office and even before so we can t begin to discuss what might make you feel comfortable in a way where you could help us understand what it is 
that that's making you feel so alienated. It's something we don't, I, I heard you, but I, I don't know what to do about it. And I'd like to continue our conversation, so I'll give you a card. One also point is that traditionally, especially in the last 15 years, 10 years, as you've seen changes in immigration law, immigration law has been tightened and tightened and tightened. It's driven more and more people to become citizens, people who are here long enough. One of the conundrums in this situation now is that as the immigration law is tightened, will the kind of xenophobia that you were talking about uh, discourage people? Will, will the system discourage people from becoming citizens because of this kind of heightened sense of the other? So, um, you know, one of the responses, of course, to being treated as a non-citizen is, in fact, to become a citizen, which is what I think happened dramatically in the last 10 years as immigration law was tightened. It's not clear how that works out in a war situation. Let me go to mm -hmm. the next question. Okay, Hi, my name is Nick Parada, and I go to Brew College. Um, my question is that I hear that Today in America, there are certain forces that wish to legitimize use of torture as an inter interrogation tool, um, if for the U U.S. itself to use it, or to use intelligence from countries abroad that do use inter torture as an interrogation tool, uh, which is almost as bad. Uh, what is your opinion on that topic? Um, torture? No. Yeah. I've heard. Yeah. Today in, well, I, in the news, I, I, I or use intelligence. I haven't, heard, I haven't heard torture, but I know that they want to now engage unsavory types to get real information in terms of intelligence um, from, from sectors that they haven't been able to get it because according to the government, we need unsavory types. Um, so maybe those unsavory types torture. But I do know, I mean, higher level than, than torture uh, th th is now part of the picture, assassination. You know, one of the, you know, uh, Ray, one of the points that Michael keeps talking about, Michael used the word perfection a couple of times. And, Perfection in policing is uh, impossible. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, I mean, so, you know, I mean, how do right. I mean, you agree? <laughs> it is. I mean, it is. I mean, so, I mean, talk a little bit about, you know, when he's talking, I mean, torture obviously I think is beyond the pale for, wow. for, for, for police officers here because the information wouldn't be any good. The information wouldn't be admissible in a, in a, in a court, obviously. Assuming that, assuming that the judge makes those findings and accepts that version among two contradictory versions. But I think your question was to the commissioner. I'd love yeah. to speak to no, it as well. No, I, I, I think he was talking about national security national issues security. and right. not, and not uh, uh, law enforcement. Right. Now, the other issue that was mentioned there about using <clears throat> surrogates, uh, this is a decision that uh, we're going to have to make in, in government. Uh, it's a dirty business, intelligence gathering, no question about it. Uh, there's no secret that, let's say, Egypt uh, uses less than the Marcus of Queensbury rules in getting information from uh, from people, and that's true throughout a good portion of the world. The question is, do we reject that information, or do we somehow say, "Hey, we're not going going to accept it when it when it it bears on the safety of our our own citizens"? I mean, th th this is a tough issue, but I would say we're probably going to come down on on the side of let's get the information here. Um, there's we been other to. issues about using drugs to get information from uh, from people who are in uh, our custody, and again, focused on national security issues, not on not on uh, well, criminal yeah. um, well, proceedings. Well, in, in is I I mean I I'm not necessarily at, at, at loggerheads with you on that at all, but but the ro torture is an endpoint on a road. Let's talk about stops along that road. Uh, Israel and, uh, and the Royal Ulster Constabulary in Belfast did not call what they did torture. Uh, they just gave it a different name. And it really didn't amount to most extreme forms of torture. In Israel, they, authority was sought from the Supreme Court uh, to engage in enhanced interrogation methodologies. Likewise, the Royal Ulster Constabulary in the Northern Ireland used enhanced, what is that? It doesn't mean electrodes to one's genitals or, or rape, but it does mean uh, staying up for two, three, four days, not being fed, having loudspeakers screaming at the person, doing pretty much what they did at Waco uh, to David Koresh and the Branch Davidians, uh, a methodology that was later abandoned with the, with the uh, uh, Michigan group uh, uh, with the bloodless outcome. Uh, and uh, the, the fact is that that is a danger. Now, if also who does it is an issue. I would, I, I'd, be, I'd shudder to think that it, it ever gets to that point again in America. It once was at that point, well before Miranda, it was violence that was the major issue in contesting confession. Since Miranda, uh, thank God it's gone. I, now, the issue was the silver platter. What do you do with foreign information? Like the Philippines 
uh, broke the, every rib of this fellow's body, and that led to Randy Yusuf, which led to the su- su- uh, su- uh, solution to the World Trade Center, the earlier uh, episode. Uh, I think you have to think about that. Uh, it's, it's, I understand Betsy's point that uh, um, do you want to reject the information? Well, um, maybe not. You've got it. That's on the silver platter. On the other hand, if nations around the world know that we won't reject it because they've gathered it, uh, Euclid teaches us that things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. In human, international human rights, which is the international com- counterpart of, hum- of civil liberties, there are certain doctrines called non-derogability. Uh, certain rights can be modified at times of security fears, but certain things can never be modified. Uh, torture, torture, I think, is one of them. It's a, a, what they call a just cogens rule, uh, a, a, an a priori rule, likewise slavery, uh, 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 etc. And I, I think we have to decide to what degree we're going to treat the thing instrumentally. Uh, finally, I'd just like to say this, it's a, a little extreme analogy. We don't use and we don't respect the data obtained by the Nazis from a forced experimentation of subjects. That's not to say that some of the data would not be useful. We suppress it, so to speak. We have an exclusionary rule because it's disreputable and ugly. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Maureen French, and currently I'm attending John Jay College and an intern at the Public Advocates Office. So my question is mm-hmm. for Betsy Gotham. And <laughs> I was hoping that you could comment. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> comment further on how you'll encourage illegal immigrants to contact the Public Advocates Office. And also, um, I have concerns about the racial profiling that's going on now after the World Trade Center <clears throat> inc- um, incident, because I have been getting calls in regards to that as of late as well. Well, you'll be one of the first people I'll come down and talk to to find out how you do intake the information from everybody, including illegal immigrants. Um, and, and I think it's a very important aspect of the office. I mean, I haven't had time, and I'm not really elected yet until November 6th. Uh, but, I, but I plan to, to come down and really talk to all of you and, and, and find out how, what is the best way to do the outreach. You know, I, I am going to decentralize the office and have offices in every borough and try to have a radio show already, already planned. I mean, there are all kinds of things that I'm thinking of doing, but I need a lot of help from you, so that's one point. As far as racial profiling, you know, I, I'm clearly uh, against it, and, and I believe that the only way, that the, that, uh, the best way for the public advocate to be helpful here is to assist the police department, and I've worked in the police department myself for many years, and know Commissioner Kelly very, very well, is to, to try to be uh, helpful and talk about training and supervision of, of police officers, because that's the only way you're going to do anything, I believe, about racial profiling, which of course I'm against. In terms of what's going to happen after the World Trade Center, um, tragedy. You know, we're in a very different time. And, and I, I, again, you know, I'm very reticent to say what's going to happen. I think we have to be, again, it's that same old thing. I'm like the broken record. We've got to be, we've got to make people not feel scared. People are terrified. I'm sure you're hearing it uh, in your office, right? And I, I'm going to have to balance the, what I'm going to hear of people being terrified with making sure that we're quite vigilant about not racial profiling. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Lorna Ricketts. I'm from Edgar Everest College. This is not about torture. I'm a PhD student and I'd like <coughs> to know female's role. What is female's role in, uh, in the building of New York City? And is there a cap on the agency spending? I'm sorry, was, what is FEMA? FEMA's role? I mean, FEMA. Federal Emergency right. Management. I mean, what a, I mean, a lot of applications. FEMA is, stands for Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency. And uh, what it is is a uh, large response entity uh, that goes to the scenes of, of disasters, uh, provides essentially funding. It does have personnel uh, that, that does uh, some reconstruction, a minimal number, basically done through contractors. But it is a, uh, a funding mechanism. Um, and I can tell you, I'm, I was displaced uh, out of my uh, home in Battery Park City up until just a couple of days ago, and FEMA uh, has been tremendous. They've been on the scene since uh, uh, the evening of September 11th. They've helped an awful lot of people, and uh, I think that they've done a terrific job in, in responding to uh, New York's uh, emergency. We have about uh, three minutes left. I want to ask each of you to sum up in about, you know, take about 30 seconds each and uh, talk about this balance. We, you know, you've heard, a lot of, you've heard a lot of concerns from the students, concerns for their personal uh, freedom on the streets, we start with you, Judge. We'll just, we'll just uh, go around. We'll just go around the uh, panel. Uh, what's your sense of um, 
where we stand on this on this balance between public order and private and private rights and individual rights. I mean, what would you be telling these students about how about what to, about about what to look out for as you know as we as we get deeper into this war? Well, um, these are your courts uh, and these are your institutions, and you have to know how they work. And you have to watch them, and you have to insist on knowing how they work, and uh, monitor them very, uh, very carefully, and insist on as much transparency as possible. Uh, just as Brandeis said it very beautifully when he said, "Sunshine is the uh, best disinfectant." Betsy. And I, I hope that all of you will feel that that my office, which I'll be in in, in January 1st, will be a place that if you have problems and you don't know where to solve them and you haven't gotten a response from anybody, you'll feel you can call and that we can discuss these things. We'll listen to you um, because it's going to be very important to try to strike that balance. And as I think I've tried to say, I don't know how to do that. I do know that there's a lot of fear and I have to be very, that's what I've been elected for, to try to make people not feel afraid. Michael. You will not have a balance between civil liberties and security if the people who ordinarily advocate civil liberties fold. <laughs> uh, if they just give up because it's not popular to speak freely, uh, if, they, if the students uh, allow people to say that your free speech is seditious behavior, um, if you don't have the courage and the stamina to stand up and know the culture of freedom and, and to make it survive, there will be no balance. Government will take all your freedom and all your privacy. Right. I think there will be a balance. I think it will be a new normalcy that we all have to uh, work through. Right now it's a very difficult time. No question about it. We all have a, a heightened sense of, uh, of concern. But we will reach a, a balance. Things will get back to, uh, to a more uh, normal way uh, of life. It will change. Some of, our, some of our, our way of living, I think, has been uh, changed uh, irreparably. But uh, we're going to get back. I, I have confidence in our uh, efforts that are going forward now, our law enforcement efforts and uh, military efforts. And I think we are, uh, you're going to see some people taken into custody, that, that sort of thing. And we'll get back to a, uh, to a level where I think we can, we can all function uh, uh, closer to the way we were prior to September 11th than we are right now. You know, there's a degree to which the, to which the uh, debate we're having today between public order and private rights and individual rights is as old as the country. And, um, uh, and I, think the, the, I think that debate has become intensified because of the war situation. And um, as we move forward, I think we all have to keep our eyes open, both for threats to the country and for threats to our individual rights. And this is a balancing act that's as old as the country, and it's not going to be changing soon. Thank you very much.